My name is Richard Easter. Are you a scientist, Richard? I am indeed a scientist. Uh -huh. What kind of scientist are you? Um, I'm a cosmologist. I think about how the universe began and how it got to be the way that it looks like today. Oh, and what books are you reading? What books am I reading? Yep. Oh, I haven't read any books for the last couple of weeks, actually. Okay, um, how about music? What your favorite music? Uh, what music have I been listening to? I've been listening to a lot of old New Zealand music that suddenly seems to have turned up on the um, iTunes uh, store. Oh, you like Crowded House? Uh, so Crowded House and, and um, Flight of the Concords. Flight of the Concords, that's, not, that's, that's new, not old, but yeah, no, <laughs> okay. I've been exploring the back catalog. <laughs> Alright, so we have a course here that we're trying to understand the origin of the universe. Right. Now, one, we're going to be talking about something coming from nothing. Now, one of these things, that, I mean, we physicists think we know what nothing is, we call it the vacuum. Right. And you inflationary theorists talk about the false vacuum. Mm. So could you tell us, for non-scientists, what false vacuum is? So false vacuum is a state. Um, we believe that it's possible for the universe to get itself into where almost nothing changes, so there are no particles, but you have um, some amount of energy density that lives at every point in space. But the key thing is, is there's some other configuration of the universe that has a lower energy than the one that you're currently at. And that somehow you can get from the false vacuum to the to the true vacuum. So do you, now is this invented for inflation? No, it's an idea that's been around in a variety of ways. I guess um, sort of going back at least thirty or forty years that that there may be a, a, a some or many you know possible configurations of the universe, and that it's possible to hop between them. Certainly, the, the first thinking about this was certainly being done by the late nineteen seventies and perhaps before that. Well, do we have any false vacuum in this room? We hope not. <laughs> <laughs> Even on small scales, we can't think of, uh, I mean, are there inflationary universes being born between you and the camera right now? Uh, um, we're guessing not. Um, Why? But it seems that inflation is something that happens at very high energy scales. And also, it seems that if you wanted to make new little pockets of false, of, you know, if you want to make a, a new piece of you know, lower energy vacuum, so not necessarily true vacuum, but less false vacuum than the first one, then it's probably easier to do that at high energies than it is at low energies, at least inside of this room. So do you believe in false vacuum? Is that how you best understand the origin of our universe? Um, First there was false vacuum and then there was vacuum? <laughs> I, I don't know if I believe in it is the right word, but it's a remarkably fertile um, set of ideas to follow if you're trying to get a sense of how high energy physics might have worked. Well, how about virtual particles? What role do they play in this idea of false vacuum? Uh, so virtual particles are a slightly different thing. and the, the Quantum, the quantum universe allows us to make, um, you know, quantum, the quantum um, theory says that things can be somewhat indeterminate, I guess. And so we think of the energy conservation as being an absolute rule, but it's, the indeterminacy of quantum mechanics allows you to borrow particles from the vacuum, and then as long as you put them back quickly enough. And so these vir virtual particles are particles that we've borrowed from the true vacuum, um, by virtue of the sort of uncertainty principle in quantum mechanics. And they, they are definitely in this room. But if, if you have a different vacuum, you have a false vacuum, wouldn't you have more virtual particles coming into and out of existence? In some sense, there's more energy in the vacuum? The energy sits in the vacuum, but it's not necessarily going to let you make particles out of it. It's the energy... It's not. I mean, that's my understanding of it. I mean, there's, there's more than one possible... You know, false vacuum covers a lot of different ideas, but the, the vacuum, the energy that sits in the vacuum, in some sense, at least in terms of you know, interactions inside of this room, that energy is latent. It's not necessarily... And, you, know, it's, you don't need false vacuum in order to make virtual particles. Right, but the question is whether if you have more false vacuum or higher energy vacuum or higher energy vacuum, do you necessarily have a, your seething froth of virtual particles <laughs> seethes more and you have more... Um, if it's at very high energies, yeah, um, that would be true because there's some temperature that's associated with the false vacuum. And the higher the energy of the false vacuum, the higher the temperature and the more um, you know, virtual particles you would have running around. But Did you just say that a vacuum can have temperature? Seems that way, yeah. <laughs> Same way that a black hole can have temperature, it has a you know a temperate. You know, so uh, um, you know even a low energy state has some, uh, you know vacuum state has some fluctuations that sit inside of it, and it has some temperature that's associated with it. So could you give us a very simple description of how you understand the origin of our universe? Uh, you know I don't know. I really um. So what I do know, what we do know, is that our universe is expanding, and if you follow that expansion back to uh, you know, some finite time in the past. It appears that our universe was infinitely dense, and so we call that moment the Big Bang and then the subsequent evolution of the universe. What that moment actually consisted of 
Um, uh, you know, I, I have there's a variety of different ideas that people consider, but um, not all of them look like each other. You know, one question, you know, the first pe question that people want to ask often when they hear about the Big Bang, or well, first questions are, you know, did it happen more than once? In other words, is our universe one of a sequence of universes? Mm -hmm. And has it happened in more than one place? And there are some visions of the Big Bang, or ideas about the Big Bang, where the answer to those questions is yes, and other visions where the answers would be no. Well, how about uh, some people talk about pre-Big Bang stuff. Was, did time exist before the, the Big Bang in any sense that makes sense? And many, I think, <laughs> cosmologists would kind of disagree on this, I guess. I think if you wanted to, yeah, if you, if you wanted to get a bunch of cosmologists arguing about stuff, you would ask them that question. And so, I, I mean, my own personal philosophy as a scientist is to be quite conservative about this. Is that I try to ask questions about things that I think I can calculate. And so... I, there are different, there are, you know, from a point of view of a given observer, you know, we have a big bang in our past, but that may not have created the whole universe. That big bang may have happened inside of some larger universe. And in that case, you know, it's perfectly reasonable to think of time existing outside of our universe. In other scenarios, you know, time doesn't sensibly exist until, until the big bang happens. I mean, it's a, so, so that one could go either way. There are scenarios where both of those, where both possible answers to that question are, are true. So let's suppose that we're, we're had an, we're in the universe. We're going to pretend we're in the universe, and there's false vacuum all around. And this is before inflation. Inflation is about to happen. Yeah, yeah. Does that make any sense to say that? Yeah, it does. I mean, one of the questions is: so we we understand that inflation has the job of kind of wiping. You know, so the Big Bang happens, and if a Big Bang, you know, you have some don't know exactly what it is, but after the Big Bang, the universe can be quite messy. Um, you know, the universe is like a baby. Babies don't have to be particularly clean, and inflation's job is to wipe the universe clean of whatever was left over from the Big Bang and sort of set the, you know, set the clock ticking on, on you know, for it to evolve, for the universe to evolve into the form that we see it having today. Um, and so, you know, before inflation happens, it's quite possible to imagine that the universe existed and that all sorts of stuff was going on inside of it. I have two things in my mind. Uh, so one is that I think of uh, uranium nucleus in which one decays and one doesn't, and we have no hidden variables inside to cause it to decay. Right. On the other hand, I can ask the question, what caused inflation? Or when I ask the question, caused inflation, is that analogous to asking the question, what caused this particular nucleus to decay? In other words, I'm assuming a hidden variable and I shouldn't be? No, I think you can ask, I mean, I think the bigger question is, why does a uranium-235 nucleus decay differently from a uranium-238 nucleus? You know, they've got three extra neutrons. And so the stability of those two configurations is different, yeah. and the decay modes are different. And so we've, the cause for that, if you like, is the way that nuclear physics works. If you understand nuclear physics well, you can tell me why it is that one of those things undergoes fission and the other one just... just right, but I have two 235s here. One decays one, and one doesn't. One doesn't. Um, in, that case, in that case, the question becomes, you know, like... Um, in that case, you could imagine that, yeah, a little patch of the universe sort of tunnels its way through from a false vacuum into a less false vacuum, and that would be, as we understand it, that would be a process that was quantum mechanical in exactly the same way that a decay of a nucleus is quantum mechanical. Doesn't that strongly suggest that there are other universes? Yes, it does. So do you think that there are other universes? My, my guess is, is that almost all of the scenarios that I've seen that could describe the Big Bang um, seem to be things that could happen more than once. So, but you said could happen, not necessitate or strongly suggest happening more than once. I, no, okay, I can see, I can see where you're going with this. No, my, my, I mean to be clear about this, my, I'm completely comfortable with the idea that our universe is not the only one. Um, because because for precisely the reasons that you said, you know, the universe keeps on. You know, if you have at least if you have a scenario of the Big Bang where you have this large false vacuum and you're propagating little pieces of that into the true vacuum then the region, you know, the false vacuum is continually replenishing itself because it's expanding. And so you would never get to a point where you'd run out of false vacuum and you'd turn it all into true vacuum. And so you'd be continually generating, you know, one new one universe after another inside of this. And that process in principle could happen, you know, for an infinite amount of time into the future. Can I... Now, you're made out of baryons, and As presumably there's something in the universe, but when there's false vacuum, we say there's nothing in the universe in the, in the sense of no no matter. 
Um, so right. there's no material. I mean, the nothing that's made out of kind of localized little blobs of. I mean, so so an atom is a you know very localized little blob of matter and energy with a very specific configuration. So there would be plenty of energy in the universe. It's just that you wouldn't be able to organize it easily into particles when it's you know with a false vacuum. So a false vacuum, there's a lot. You know, the energy density of the universe can be very high. But the matter, you know, the amount but that's of that's all in the vacuum, though, right? But it's all in the vacuum, and therefore you cannot have a velocity with respect to it. Uh, no, you. I mean, we can have. You can't have a, a velocity with respect to a vacuum. Energy. But if the false vacuum is, um, you know, the universe that's dominated by false vacuum, then that would be what we call a de Sitter space. Yeah. And so, you, an observer in, in a de Sitter space would know whether or not they were moving relative. Well, hang on, a de Sitter space. You need to be a little bit careful about. Yeah. But. The, but the, um, the on, actually, I, I'm gonna you can it. have a speed limit with respect to baryons yeah, or yeah, CMB, yeah. but if you only have vacuum, you can't have a speed with respect to that. There's no, there's no uh, speed limit. No, no. I, see, I, I, I think, yeah, I think I have, to, I have to actually take notice on that one and actually think in detail about, you know, the, so, so, so a universe that has absolutely no particles in it then has, you know, um, has more symmetries than one that doesn't. Well, a universe and, with false vacuum, yeah. does it have any particles in it? <sighs> I'm gonna ha actually, I'm going to have to stop and think about it. Okay. <laughs> no, I think this is, this is the, I mean, because, yeah. the, 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 I mean, just aside, aside so, so if we're talking about something that's a strict city universe, then it has, you know, it has a temperature that's associated with it. And I'd actually have to sit down and think, whether or not you know you would see a dipole if you were moving mm. with respect, but but you don't, I think, in a space because right, right. it has extra, you know it has more invariance, and so you can always choose a slicing of de space, you know. So so in a moving observer in a de space, so a moving observer in our universe sees that yeah, the, the universe CMB is, dipole, yeah. sees the CMB yeah, dipole. Yeah. A moving observer in a strict de space, mm -hmm. um, you know, you could. Your, you know, their, their, you know, their, their um, world line looks like that with respect to ours. But you could choose a different foliation of the de Sitter space where that second observer would be at rest. And because of the overall invariance of the de Sitter space, I think they see the same. You know, mm -hmm. So, so you Lorentz mean, invariant, I think, is the name for that, isn't it? But, Lorentz invariance. Well, it's stronger in the case that it's a, it's okay. the, you know, it's a different. And so, so I, I, I'm actually, I, I don't want to be. I don't want to be recorded on that one because, <laughs> because actually, right. I, I mean, I want to think. I mean, I would need. We to don't know. That. We don't know. I, we don't know. We maybe, don't know. maybe somebody else knows, but not you. <laughs> I, I do know, but I would have to sit down and think okay. about it. Okay. All right. Yeah, yeah. No, but but the, the the tricky thing is, is that usually if you're thinking about cosmology, you have some tiny relic number of particles that would break that. Um, mm, yes, you know, yes, yes. That breaks that. But right. in the case of a strict sort of space, yes, yes. Um, you have to be a little bit more careful. Now you mentioned that it's plausible and maybe even the favored model that there are other universes. Yeah. Now, often people say, well, since there are other universes, you can have different values of G or Q or C or, mm -hmm. you know. Now, do you think that that, now, if other universes are suggested by a quantum understanding of the origin of the universes, does that come along with different values of C and G? It doesn't need to. Um, so, so it you, doesn't. It, it's it's option. I mean, it's an extra layer of complexity. But is there anything about quantum theory that suggests that those vary, or is this just mathematicians playing with generalizations? No, it, it depends on your particular. Again, it depends. You know, so we talk about a false vacuum and a true vacuum. And it's possible that there are many false vacua, each of which, you know, closer or further away from the true vacuum. In each of those individual false vacua, you might think that the fundamental constants of physics had, had different values relative to each other. But this, it, that, it's not required that that is the case. I mean, it's, so you could certainly have a scenario where you had a false vacuum and a true vacuum, lots of universes that were being produced out of the false vacuum, all of which had the same basic laws of physics. Mm -hmm. There are other scenarios where the basic laws of physics would be quite different. How about if we are, if we're in a universe that's false vacuum? And we uh, send a light particle. Now, a light particle, I presume the speed of light is determined by how much this alternating electric field is, is interacting with virtual photons, virtual particles. Right, right. Now, if I change the number of virtual particles, doesn't that change the speed of light just like the change of speed of light through a glass? It has a different amount of material to interact with, and therefore it would change the speed? Or does that make no sense? I think, again, it depends, it depends on how... 
you know, a particular construction of you. I mean, there's more than one way to have a false vacuum. Uh huh. Okay, okay, so when I say the word false vacuum, I'm really just tip of the iceberg. It's yeah, that's that's exactly. a vanilla false vacuum and chocolate and strawberry. And exactly, exactly. And so I think there are certainly scenario, cosmological scenarios that people have written down where the speed of light varies as a function of time, for instance. So we think of it as mm. solid, but in the very early universe, not you know, not since stars turned on, but um, but you know whether or not those scenarios are. Um, you know, consistent with a particular idea of the false vacuum is, you know, it, depend, it depends very much on, on the particular kind of false vacuum that you're talking about. How about, uh, do you think we're living in a simulation? No. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Do you, are we alone? Um, as far as we can tell, there's nothing special about our star um, or our, the galaxy that we live in. So, uh, you know, it may be that we're, um, that we're in some sense, you know, there may be some special kind of you know, alignment of circumstances that has to happen to produce a planet like ours, um, to produce life. We, you know, we don't know that how that happens, but given that what happened produced us, it seems likely to me that we have, you know, that the same process has occurred elsewhere. I think the bigger question is how long we're going to last. <laughs> and, and so, you know, if each, you know, if you produce intelligent life and then it makes life uninhabitable or makes its home uninhabitable, you know, too quickly for it to figure out what it's doing to itself, then I think it may be that each you know, each flowering of life may be relatively short, and in, in that sense, we may, you know, the universe may be less populated than it might, 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 might otherwise be the case. I think there's some risk of that. The students of this course are not necessarily scientists, right. and so they're trying to get a grip on the origin of the universe. It sounds so right. compelling. It sounds like, oh, i got to revert to religion or something. Uh. Now, what can you help under, a, a student of humanities or history understand the origin of the universe in less than a minute? I think the key thing to think about is we don't, I'm going to tell, I'll think about it for a minute, and then I'll talk about it. Um, I think the key, the key part of it, or the key understanding that comes out of the Big Bang, is that there seems to be a finite point in the past where the universe, as we currently understand it, didn't exist, and then you know, so a finite time from the present back into the past, and we don't know exactly what that moment was, but we're certainly able to think about what happened inside of the universe. Um, you know, tiny fraction of a second after that time, and do calculations and test predictions that come out of those calculations. So we know, we know the history of the universe, but we don't necessarily understand its birth. But didn't you just assume that time existed before our universe? So we, whether or not it exists before or after our universe, the thing that we think of our uni as of our universe, the moment that we would see as the Big Bang, that happens at some finite point in our past. So you can't, I guess what I'm saying is, is you can't stave off the Big Bang by assuming that the universe lasts for some infinite amount of time and sort of is kind of frozen and it sort of gradually unfolds. It seems, as far as we can tell, that the universe really does have a finite age. Now, I'm interested in, in the entropy problem, the idea that when you look at the CMB, it looks like it's in maximum entropy, very, you know, isothermal and no chemical gradients, and so it's like maximum entropy. But then here we are today talking, creating entropy. <laughs> so how is it, did you start out at maximum entropy and here we are ever increasing entropy from that state? Penrose has famously said, oh, there's God putting a, a very low initial condition at the very beginning. He doesn't like inflation, and so he needs God to start the low, in, low initial entropy. You know, I think the fairest answer is to say that we don't understand the initial state of the universe um, in, a, in a way that's well enough to say, say what's natural and what's not natural. I'm, I'm very nervous. I mean, certainly inflation provides a dynamical mechanism for making the universe much bigger. Um, you know, relative to what it might otherwise have been, and that seems to naturally solve you know some most initial conditions problem. But again, you know, it, it, there are mechanisms that allow you to address these problems, but there aren't. Um, you know, none of them are compelling in the absence of a detailed model. But I, I mean, the, the idea that the universe has to start in a high entropy state or has to start in a low entropy state, I, I don't think we know the answer to that. I think it's a supposition on our part to say that. You know, this is the way that the universe has to start, therefore we have a problem or we don't have a problem. I don't, I don't think we know the answer to that. But it has to start at lower entropy than it is now, right? Since the second law says it's increasing. Uh, so it's a question, the second law says the, universe, the amount of entropy in a closed system increases as, or increases mm -hmm. or stays constant as a function of time. Mm -hmm. But I think if you look at, you know, you're allowed to do isolated things inside of the universe, you have phase transitions, you have, you know, a lot more complexity than you do inside of a very simple system. And so I think, I think, uh, I think the, 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 um, you know, the way, the, the way, you know, it's, it's, 
it's not clear to me that we actually understand how to think about entropy on the on the scale of something like the universe. So, for instance, maybe maybe a better analogy or better a way to understand or sneak up on this is that people looking at general relativity often say, well, where does how is energy conserved in general relativity? Mm -hmm. So, you know, inflation in particular says that the energy density of the universe stays roughly constant, but the universe gets much bigger. So, you, you know, you take a box and you make it if you have a box of rocks and you make it bigger. The density goes down but because the number of rocks inside of it has stayed the same. If you take the universe, it's inflating, and you make it bigger. The density stays constant, so it looks like the total mass of the universe has gone up. And you say, well, how is that consistent with energy conservation? Mm -hmm. And then when you look at general relativity, general relativity is derived by assuming that energy is conserved. I mean, that's how Einstein arrived at the general theory of relativity. Mm -hmm. So anything that's consistent with general relativity in some sense has to conserve energy because that's right. that's cooked into it from the beginning. But understanding in detail how energy is conserved in general relativity is really hard. You know, so where you know where is the energy living as any given you know as any right. given amount of time? And I think the same is true of you know if you if you want to talk about entropy in an expanding universe. You know, very simple saying, oh, you know, the universe become, you know, things become more disordered as a function of time. Uh, you know, I think, I think you have to be very careful with those statements in, in an expanding universe because simply doing the math that accounts for where the, you know, what's going on in terms of the thermodynamics, it's, it's not at all trivial and it's not at all clear that the universe is necessarily in thermal equilibrium for most of its you know, life. So you have, you know, non-equilibrium thermodynamics, which makes you know, things, things intrinsically more complex than they might be. So I, I'm very nervous about arguments about entropy, or very simple arguments about entropy, is that then allow you to draw conclusions about the way that the universe has to be. So how about these uh, CMB photons, these cosmic microwave background photons? They're losing, they're they're getting redder. They're losing yeah. energy. Where's that energy going? Well, that's exactly the point. How do you understand? Because you know, if you ran the, I mean, the universe conserves energy. So if you ran you know, in a collapsing universe, the the energy would be coming back from somewhere. So suddenly. Somehow or other, that energy is, is oh. stored inside of the larger universe, but we, it's very hard to put your finger on exactly where Well, how about is. lambda? If the universe is expanding, there's more energy density in it, so where did that energy come from? Well, that, that one in some ways is easier to understand. So if you look at a cosmological constant and you say, well, imagine, imagine I take a spring and I stretch it, and so I put energy into the spring as I stretch it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the, the total, you know, the energy density of the spring in terms of, you know, a linear spring wouldn't drop away as fast as it would if, if I, you know, if I hadn't had to store that extra energy in, because the energy has some mass. And so cosmological constant is really saying that the universe has, you know, it's a sort of spring that you have to, you have to work in order to stretch it, and you're pulling in each direction. And so you're storing energy in the universe by making it larger, because it's the energy that's associated with the, you know, with the stretching, and the space is slightly stretchy. And as you stretch space, you have to store energy in, in it to make that happen. So I think in that sense, we know where that energy is coming from. The second part of it is why, why storing energy in space makes the universe feel like that it wants to expand at an accelerated rate. Yes. And that seems to make sense in the context of, you know, if you don't, you know, if you're keeping the energy density of space constant, then you're not diluting what's inside of it. And so whatever the expansion rate of the universe was, you know, at one time has to be the same at some later time because it only, the, the expansion rate of the universe just depends on, at least in Einstein's theory, just depends on the density. And so, you know, there's a, there's a, you know, the, 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 the natural assumption to make is, is that if the universe has a lot of, you know, if you, if you, you know, is it, the, the, if you have to stretch the universe, that it would, that would actually slow it down rather than speed it up. But what it really does is it keeps the density fixed, and it's the density that determines how fast the universe mm -hmm. expands, and that keeps the expansion rate of the universe fixed. I mean, it's a, it's a technical argument because it relies on the way that general, you know, ex expanding universe works in general relativity. But it's one that I think makes sense to a working cosmologist. Are you the result of a quantum fluctuation? As, as, as are we all, it would seem to be. <laughs> <laughs> Not me okay. personally. <laughs> okay. Now, how about the interface between cosmology and religion? I'm going to be interviewing a couple of like rabbis and priests about, you know, are we alone? And, uh, mm -hmm. you know, but what did, did it give me your personal take on that? Okay, my personal take on that is I'm an atheist. Um, I, I was sent to a, you know, a, a private school that had a chaplain. Um, by my parents, and he used to cane people, so I wasn't. You know, that, was my, <laughs> that was my primary contact with the religion. But um, I, I think more more seriously, I, I think the thing that surprises me most is how little cosmology and religion actually have to do with each other. So I've worked on projects where you know there were other people who you know from a variety of faith traditions, so Buddhists, or um, you know people from a Christian background, people from Muslim background, uh, people from Jewish background, sometimes all on the same project. And as far as I could tell. We all approach cosmology in essentially the same way as each other, whether or not we're actively religious 
or just in terms of the sort of intellectual tradition that we've grown up in, inside of. And so, if you know, if you if you if the way that you're doing cosmology doesn't depend on, at the very least, your kind of cultural exposure to the religion, mm. the surprising thing is, is that in some ways, you know, that if if there really was a connection between cosmology and religion, you might expect that people with different religious backgrounds would see cosmology you know, differently. Mm -hmm. And as far as I can tell, we don't. And so, I think the really surprising thing is, is you know, is that very little. You know, unless you're very concerned about, you know, um, you know, very literal reading of Genesis, for instance, the, the overlap between cosmology and religion, I think, is actually smaller than most, um, you know, people would think if they just looked at what they saw in the news. Now, um, John Oliver, a comedian, interviewed Hawking, and Hawk and John Oliver asked, "What is the your your contribution to cosmology that is so underappreciated that no one understands or use it?" And he said, "It." So imaginary i, you know, square root of negative one times time. So he converted t into a spatial dimension. Right, right. Now, he was also working on this, and he went to the Vatican, and the, and the Pope at the time says, yes, you guys can work about what happened after the Big Bang. We, you know, God made the Big yeah, Bang. Yeah, yeah. And, and Hawking famously said, snickered to himself, well, that's what I'm working on. Now I can create a universe. <laughs> so what do you think of IT? Um, I mean, I think to some extent, the, the, the thing that Hawking did, it's a calculational convenience. I mean, it's not clear that we can really take, you know, I mean, the physical meaning of imaginary time, I think, is a, is a, is a, um, is a, is a, is a tough one. <laughs> well, I mean, uh, Dirac said, hey, look at this, my equation predicts antimatter. What is that? I have no idea. Then, you know, so, <laughs> so that's a... I mean, I think the, the interesting, I mean, the interesting thing about the relationship between the Catholic, I mean, is that, you know, the big idea of the Big Bang was co-invented by a Catholic, um, well, in one signal. Um, you know, an ordained um, cleric in the Catholic Church, um, the Matra. So, I mean, I think in that sense that, you know, the Catholic Church has been comfortable with the idea of the Big Bang because they feel some, you know, greater connection to it than they did mm -hmm. to the heliocentric solar system with, you know, Galileo and Copernicus. Um, the, 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 I mean, I, I think, yeah, you know, again, it's a question of whether or not I'm comfortably, you know, whether or not you can find a kind of comfortable physical interpretation for something that you use to make a, a quantum mechan you know, a quantum mechanical calculation that describes the beginning of the universe, at least the one that Hawking's talking about, whether that matches what we mean, I mean, the, this idea of going from a false vacuum to a true vacuum, that's a slightly different, phys well, somewhat different physical scenario. Okay. And we probably have a mutual friend in Max Tegmark, and he's talking about the mathematical universe, and that all possible logically consistent yeah. mathematical constructs are real, and yeah. our universe is, what do you make of those ideas? I think that, the, you know, I mean, so this is like different levels of multiverse. I mean, I don't, I mean, to be honest, I don't know whether or not I, I would necessarily trust my weight to some of the more, the strongest statements there. I mean, and maybe the large chunks of mathematics are sort of, you know, that you don't really, I mean, I don't know that you really have any choice about mathematical truth, I think. Mm -hmm. You know, that's something that may exist independently of the sort of, you know, the physical nature of the universe. So, I mean, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm somewhat... Okay. Um, I'm not, yeah. <laughs> How about Lee Smollin wrote a book called Life of the Cosmos in which Darwinism was invoked as a, some type of way to, I don't know, mm -hmm. weed out uh, universes that didn't produce as many multi uh, many baby universes. What do you think of those ideas? Um, I, I, I'm familiar with Lee's work on that. Personally, I'm, I'm less comfortable with that because I think it doesn't seem to me that our universe, I mean, so I think his argument was the universe tries to produce as many black holes as it can, and then you produce new universes inside of those black holes. I mean, firstly, the idea that there's a new universe inside of a black hole, I think, is contentious. But secondly, I could see ways to twiddle parameters in our universe that will produce a lot more black holes than we currently have. Mm -hmm. So if it's true that we should have a maximal number of black mm -hmm. holes in our universe, then that doesn't seem to be the case. So you think we already know that the the rate of black hole production is not optimal given the parameters of our That's universe? That's my belief, yeah. So oh. I'm thinking in that sense, I'm thinking that Lee's, this idea of Lee's is probably, is probably not one that describes our universe. Uh -huh. Have you published that? Is that I, I don't know that. I have never read that paper. Um, I, I don't know that I've ever actually seen a place where Lee's published this idea in a, peer, in, you know, in, right, right. In a paper. I think it's in his book, but I don't think... I mean, I actually looked for it once, and, mm -hmm. and, and but I, I remember actually seeing him give a talk on it, and the same idea appeared. You know, appeared you know, when he, I mean, I've seen him give a talk on it, and I wasn't the only person in the audience to be struck by that thought. <laughs> now, we talked about whether in these, these other universes that are suggested by quantum mechanics that maybe C and G, quantum mechanics does not suggest that C and G could be different, but does it suggest that the degree of baryon asymmetry of these other universes could
could be different. That, that's something that's very easy to imagine. You know, many mechanisms that would produce baryonic symmetry in our different amounts would, would produce different amounts in different places. Yeah. So you think that is a legitimate variable in this <laughs> multiverse scenario? <laughs> yes, yes. Much more legitimate than C or G variation? Um, yeah, I think G is likely. I mean, G is more likely to be something that's already cooked into the universe by the time you're producing mm -hmm. baby universes. Likewise, C. Um, baryon and you know those are dimension four quantities and so usually you can only you're only going to be aware of you know numbers that don't have units associated with them changing from one place to another uh -huh. um, but I think you know something like baryon asymmetry it's easy to imagine they're changing from place to place uh -huh. I mean not not guaranteed by any means but certainly meaningful to think about it so then you can invoke uh, at least a weak anthropic principle saying that well if their baryon asymmetry was zero it would be all photons we wouldn't be here so yeah. we need a certain level of or if you overdid it you know you would cook all of the hydrogen in the universe into helium you know right after the big bang and then you couldn't make any stars and that you know you'd still have a universe you just wouldn't have any you know, stars or planets. And so, so you're much more comfortable with baryon asymmetry variation than variation of these other things? Um, yeah, because that seems to be some, I mean, it's certainly, it's certainly easier to imagine scenarios in which they change, but partly because, you know, we don't necessarily understand, you know, we don't have a mechanism that allows C to change from one place to another. Mm -hmm. Well, it's not an easy one, but we do have, we you know, many baryon asymmetry mechanisms are something where, you know, where there's a kind of free parameter that floats around that you could imagine being, you know, different in different places. Okay, so any, uh, do you have any comments for, to these students about how they should think about how we got here? I think it's, it's in some ways the questions we're asking, so, so um, the, ask your parents how they met, or if, you, know, um, um, you know, or um, think about you know, how it is that, that things happen in our lives. So if your parents hadn't met, um, you wouldn't be here, or if, you know, there's, there's all sorts of huge contingencies that exist in any of our lives for us to be walking on the planet. And if we, so there may be very, very long um, you know, extreme coincidences that produce our particular universe and allow us to live inside of it. You know, not just a universe that we can even exist inside of, but a universe that has our particular star in this particular place and a planet that forms where our planet forms. You know, if the you know, mix that you know, in the soup that produced our sun was slightly different, you know, the Earth would be too far or too close from the sun, we wouldn't be able to live on it. But the same thing that says, you know, if two people didn't accidentally meet each other and then, you know, start a family, then you wouldn't exist. But if we say to someone, how would you feel if your parents had never met, then you can't answer that question because you didn't, you know, because... But, but the, the parents would probably marry somebody else and there'd be other children that don't exist, that would exist, that don't exist now. And so, so, so exactly. But our personal feeling about, you know, as a, as, a, as a people, our feeling about how we would feel if our planet didn't exist... I see. Is you know it may be that in order to produce our planet you need some very long series of coincidences to happen, mm -hmm. but we can't exist a uni we can't observe a universe that's incompatible with our existence inside of it, and no matter how long a shot that is, then that shot has to happen before we can make that observation. Jared Diamond once said that studying life on New Zealand is the closest we'll get to studying extraterrestrial <laughs> life. <laughs> Comments? Um, there's certainly some really weird animals in New Zealand. <laughs> That's what he means. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I mean, I think, in, I mean, in a sense, what you have in New Zealand is more that the clock stopped on evolution in New Zealand and that there are no, you know, there are no native mammals. And so it's like an extreme example of the Galapagos finch where you have, you know, a handful of birds that radiate out into ecological niches that would be filled by other animals on other islands. But in New Zealand, you know, everything was birds and there were no mammals until until people turned up and brought mammals with them and then that was bad news for the birds. Mm -hmm. So so let me ask you again uh, the question, are we alone? I am, I, I, you know, I haven't, uh, I'm happy, I'm happy with the, I, I mean, I'm, I would be very surprised if we were the only life in the universe. I think it's possible that intelligent life is a lot rarer than life, but um, I'm sorry. I would be entirely, I would be delighted but unsurprised to find out that we were not alone. I would be astonished to find out that we were completely alone in the universe. It doesn't seem like that to me. So the people who, the Fermi paradox you're aware of, so what's your favorite solution to the Fermi paradox? Uh, which kind, I mean... Uh, the fact that we, if, if uh, there were intelligent life elsewhere in the universe and uh, elsewhere in the galaxy, yeah. the galaxy is 10 billion years old, you know, we know that the Earth is a young star, so they have you know, the average Earth, I think, is about two billion years yeah. older. Therefore, they should have colonized the galaxy and we would have known about them and they should be here. It might be that, that you know, that, that intelligent civilization, or you know, species that survive over long periods of time are maybe less expansionist than us. And so, you know, we think, I mean, there's a, I think the Fermi paradox has a very strong cultural component loaded into it that, 
you know, the, the sort of this manifest destiny of human beings, or you know, obviously sometimes even particular groups of human beings, you know, job is to kind of fill the world not only with people, but with their particular kind of people. The arguments that have been made against that is that you will always have a spread of culture and whichever, you always have some that will want to expand, and therefore they're the ones that will... But okay. maybe, well, I mean, I guess there's two possibilities. The first one is it's just that the energy cost of getting to other stars, you know, is always going to um, swamp the... the um, the you know the utility, so you know space travel is hard. It uses up a lot of energy. You're always going to have better things to do with your time as a civilization. But the other thing may be that the more expansionist, you know, you know if you if you're overly expansionist, you use up all of the resources available in your solar system before you can get out of it, and you just don't survive to tell a tale. I mean, the long, the longest lived civilizations might be the ones that want to live quietly at home. Well, how about the the idea that the the uh the uh, aliens are living in the false vacuum. That they are, the energy that we're seeing, think is a, a false vacuum is just noise, is not noise, but that's the signal that aliens are talking to each other. I, I think, I mean, uh, I, I think the idea that you have organized structure in a false vacuum is probably, because you know, you know, life in the end Would we know? Do we if have enough a, measurements a, of the Casimir effect or something to figure out whether there is... If it's a false vacuum, it's by definition not particularly well organized. I, mean, I, I know that, but yeah. do we have any measurements to suggest that there's absolutely no organization in the false vacuum and the virtual particles and like lamb shift, for example? I think... Uh, I, think you need to, I think you need to define the question a little bit. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, thank you very much for your the interview there. Yeah, that's great. <laughs>